Yeah. So I'm going to move on um, um, to the second of the evening. Um, very lucky to have uh, Lewis from Appwire, who is going to talk about um, best practice applications delivery in the cloud native world. Thank you, Lewis. Cheers, thank you. Um, well, thanks for having us. Um, yep, my name is Lewis Marshall. Um, I work for Appvia, and that is what we're going to talk about. So, first, uh, a little introduction. I'll cover who I am. Who I am, is that better? Yes. Excellent. Um, who I am and who Appvia is. Um, we're going through what is changing um, in the landscape that affects your application delivery, um, a bit of control and choice, best practice, and hopefully something that's worth taking away from my talk. So I want you to think about a little bit um, as I go through this, um, what your application delivery looks like um, and how some of these touch points may, may sort of resonate. Um, so there we go. So me, a um, bit of a spaceman. Um, so I'm a site reliability engineer at Appvia um, and I've picked up this tech evangelist mantle. So. Let's see how this goes. Um, so I've got 28 years of, let's call it exposure, in the industry. Started off um, writing 88, um, 886 assembly language um, firmware um, BIOS code on this little thing here. Um, worked a whole range of large institutions um, with highly regulated environments um, from pharmaceuticals, um, finance and the home office. Um, and I'm also a bit of a space geek, and I ride a one wheel, so look up what that is. Um, so, Appvia, um, we make open source products, um, we're developer focused, we're born from a team that worked um, together with a, um, a management of the software development lifecycle and sort of platform arena. So we've always um, provided support and consultancy within that remit. Um, so our customers have always been the developers in an organization. Um, and we provide support and consultancy around Kubernetes, I guess, and the software development lifecycle. Kubernetes is just our bread and butter. Obviously, the landscape's changing, and we try and go up the software development lifecycle as well as down it. Um, so organizational best practice working in very large institutions we work in um, government is um, our biggest client but we um, we've all um, worked in a whole range of different industries um, that are typically large um, we're also cops um, maintainers so we're maintainers of the cops project and we've um, contributed a fair bit to the security um, and the other concerns from an early time with kubernetes way back at 0.6 uh, in 2015, I think. Um, not production, but we were in production at 0.9 um, when we managed to address some of the concerns about the orchestration of the, the bits underneath. And we're a Cloud Native um, Computing Foundation member. So, application delivery. The business just wants an application. Just deliver it, it's easy. Um, got a couple of personas here. So we've got a dev. A rogue dev, <laughs> mainly because of the hair. Um, but she, she's showing off an application that's well formed, it does everything the business wants, it's already running, um, and the business is ready to go with that. What, what's the problem? We've got it on my laptop. Um, the software development lifecycle reality, unfortunately, um, Emmett is <laughs> our operations persona here. Um, the development services that make up um, the immediate concerns of a developer before they can even check in code um, exist a, across a whole wide gamut of services, SaaSes and products. Um, and then that's even without the hosting infrastructure and the operational concerns that then come into play to actually get that laptop um, software <laughs> Um, away from our rogue developer and uh, introduce a bit of best practice and scaling concerns and all the other things. So, yeah, unfortunately, the operations is upsetting our poor developer and our business. So, the developer need simplicity and agility. So, I mean, there's a we've spoken about agility already this evening, but um, 
there's a lot of metrics in the industry as well that I'm not going to go into that show that at the simplest level, delivering quickly drives out um, reliability um, due to the, the speed of iteration and the ability to experiment and fail early. Um, but the reality is there's a complexity involved in all those different products and the interfaces and the choice involved. Um, I've got them all crying again. Um, and these are typically delays and lead times. So I want to come at this from you know what, what's changing in the environment, what's driving these change. So um, Simon Wardley, very famous um, chart here, talking about how things move towards commodity. And if we use one of the probably the poster child in the cloud native land of Kubernetes. Oh, no, I'm not going to try to set it properly. Um, so Kubernetes, the hard way back in the Genesis, it was the only way you could do it. Um, a hell of a lot of documentation. Um, and then DevOps, sort of the hard way plus DevOps, you take that documentation and try and automate it. Um, it's still not a product. It's very much custom built. And um, it, we, you know, a platform team delivering that sort of functionality. Um, and then productization and, and COPS being one product that we backed early, but you know, that's not the only, only um, player in the game. Um, we maintained COPS and introduced a whole load of security features for clients around ETCD and we've got all the PRs around that sort of stuff. Um, but we're maintaining now, so we, we've been running with that for a long time, but that's changing, you know. Um, Nowadays, Kubernetes is becoming a commodity. Um, EKS, just one example of the, of the cloud providers that, that enable you to run Kubernetes very simply. Um, so what's changing? Source, uh, Alibaba Cloud. This, this again is a slide that's repeated from many, many sources actually. Um, but this one's going over um, what's the difference between uh, what you're managing and what the provider's managing. Hopefully, you know, we're driving towards this environment where the developer concerns are around the application and the data the application needs, and not around all the other things, the operate, um, operation concerns. Um, another um, slide here from Pivotal showing um, some of the same um, things, but you know, illustrating also that all the previous paradigms still exist. There's no such thing as actual serverless. Um, although, you know, FAS is, you know, definitely trending in the right direction. SaaS in this space, although it's a, a dependency potentially, it's not actually the concern of an application team, unless obviously the business is delivering a SaaS. Um, typically, the application team will be hovering around this space. Um, but lowering the complexity of what the developer needs to interface with is what we're talking about here. And, that same decreased surface area driving operational efficiency. So I can do my own slides as well. Um, so if I quickly go through this, um, I remember dealing with a lot of hardware, dip switches, all sorts of stuff back in the day. Um, and then the DevOps epoch, um, the platform changing um, as soon as virtualization came along, cloud containers. Um, and now maybe a new epoch that we're arriving in, site reliability engineering being the role maybe, maybe a progression of DevOps maybe in addition. Um, but immutable infrastructure and cloud native products, I would argue, are the actual platform. Um, so another way of looking at it is those surface areas directly. So a command line interface to an operating system is obviously the broadest possible interface, um, very complex, lots to go wrong. DevOps and config management tried to at least codify or at least create some YAML around uh, the problem. Um, but uh, I'd say that infrastructure code and orchestration in a shared domain may be the ultimate, uh, the, the place that the industry is going. Obviously, with the Onion model showing that these things don't completely disappear, but the operating concerns of a developer change, certainly. Um, so I'm not meant to say this, apparently. Um, <laughs> infrastructure as code, okay? It's, it's said all the time. Um, 
all we want to deliver is a cloud, but actually we can uh, deliver a, some configuration in Git. Um, more YAML. Um, <laughs> what, what I would ascertain is that potentially configuration management tools provide maybe some code, uh, a domain-specific language, and an abstraction distraction in the worst case. Um, because what they're providing is potentially repeating the reinvention of the wheel. Um, and it's not necessarily very easily testable. And it's certainly the, the distraction part of what I'm trying to drive at here is the fact that the business value um, isn't from the configuration management tool. It's, it's a long way away from the problem domain. It's a, a different problem domain which may be good to uh, at least marginalise or, or, or decrease the surface area there. So real code, software as a service, there's many providers providing many of the bits of the software um, development lifecycle and indeed dependencies of applications potentially, but one way or another this is code where vendors are on the hook and their business depends on being able to scale and provide good code that, that works properly. Um, cloud services in a very sim similar gamut but you know, more, more to do with um, services that are procured as dependencies of an application, maybe by an, um, a platform team, maybe by the application, but one way or another, very scalable code. Um, infrastructure applications, so these are the bits of glue, I guess, that, that don't necessarily form the cloud services or the software as a service directly, there could be the Lego blocks that you build in order to make a platform or your application directly. And they are typically part of the cloud native landscape. So infrastructure code is repeatable and testable and probably the right unit of shareability, something that we're building together. I'd, I'd argue trying to make things scale beyond an organization. So infrastructure as code now. Maybe Emmett here is actually coding um, and is a site reliability engineer and may be embedded with an application team. Um, he might be writing code that has operational capability and has got direct business value or very close business value around observability and reliability. He may be in an infrastructure team or procuring infrastructure directly on behalf of an application, all of which is possible nowadays. Um, but one way or another, he'll be delivering scalable capability. If he's working on his day job for an org in a platform team or in an application team and he's doing pull requests to cloud native applications, then his capability is being shared and he's standing along with um, colleagues across the industry. So our new dev, scalable patterns, all, all these things are, you know, terms used with cloud native, but, you know, describe the new world that a dev finds themselves in. Um, and they can self-serve the infrastructure um, and they might be responsible for the operability of an application and potentially um, there won't be a bottleneck. But there's another slice to this entire environment. The dev may be empowered and new and ready to go, but let's just cover the but. So what I'm going over here is Amazon Web Services from Amazon 2011. It's quite a small little user interface there. Um, it <laughs> changed. <laughs> um, it's now quite complicated. Um, and it changed again in a year. <laughs> I think there's quite a lot more from last year. But anyway, we've got everyone crying there. <laughs> Just which and when and how and who's, who's managing that. So the cloud native landscape, the Lego that we might want to build our application from or depend upon or bundle. Um, that's a version, I haven't got the date, but this is a slide showing um, a graphic from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation directly. It's on their GitHub site. And these are the vendors who um, are members of that foundation. So they probably share some of these ideals about how to write an application. But that's changed as well. Um, that's you know enough to make your eyes bleed. And that really is, and they're all crying now. Um, so that's up to date this week. Um, it's just going crazy. I mean, cloud native obviously is a thing, <laughs> but you know, choosing might be a problem. Um, so choice, a new dev. Oh God, the business is already crying. <laughs> um, 
So it's a complex choice and the new delays and lead time issues um, are, are because of that choice. Um, and there's a really poor development experience. I mean, they could choose the wrong products. And when they've got all these products and interfaces, they're now dealing with changing their context between a hundred different things rather than the business concerns. So not necessarily getting, oh, falling off our one wheel here. Um, so they're not necessarily easy to provide standardization in an organization. Um, and worst case, poor security. There's a load of other poor things, um, not least the uh, developer's head there. Um, so I would ascertain exerting control and simplifying, maybe the, at least the phrase that describes what the problem, what the solution could be to that problem. But all we've got is a control. It doesn't really show you what the solution is here. Um, so the business is saying, well, how and with what? Um, so how? I'll get there. I'll just tease it out a little bit. So using cloud native products, um, there's new industry patterns and there's services that you can talk directly to and consume in your platforms or applications um, via APIs. And you can bundle products and functionality along with your application, either in your platform or as part of the application. So that's good as well. Um, and open source software means you can fix those concerns to make sure the things that you're doing in your organization, which pertain to that particular case, uh, a scaling, so good use of money all the way. So standing on the shoulders of giants or Mr. Tall in this case. So um, yeah, it's reuse and, and basically I guess I'm trying to ascertain maybe the time's right for being able to use this stuff efficiently because this stuff's becoming mature and we can reuse and the developer with a the bandage there is also maybe to use it directly. So. Um, exerting control and simplified delivery. I'm not going to go into the detail. Well, there's quite a lot for me to get through here trying to cover the entire landscape um, and how maybe we can help, but patterns for um, deployment. So the operator lifecycle manager, something you can look up, something you may be using. Um, operators in Kubernetes uh, enable you to deliver functionality and manage deployments on your behalf and manage the uh, resources that your infrastructure or your applications may depend on. Um, so for deployment and application dependencies, um, that's a win. Security and audit patterns. I mean, there's a tool um, born out of Google, another one. Um, Graphius um, managing the auditability and the visibility of the artifacts that are cloud native. So typically containers and their security concerns um, and the metadata around that, where they are and what CVEs may be present, etc. And orchestration patterns, I mean, just for the platforms or the things you want to run your applications on, just looking at Kubernetes, I mean, it's, it's a much wider area, but looking at one area of cloud native, and that's, um, we've got the Kubernetes services at the top here and the cluster API showing that even the community is iterating and simplifying how this stuff fits together. So COPS may be slightly less relevant going forward and the EKS or the GKE or, or the AKS, um, sort of around here, um, may, may become less relevant again in a new paradigm as, or they may wrap things that are shared. So they may be able to repeat um, and uplift themselves. Um, so there's a lot going on, but there's another issue. So, Although there's some good choices and some reuse and good patterns, there's still a lot of choice, so we need to filter it out. Um, so here, someone in your organization or someone running the platform or someone in your application team should really be looking at what is the community choice. Not just the trendiest thing, but the thing that meets certain criteria um, that should really be best practice um, across the industry. Now, obviously, looking at metrics that exist on individual Git repos is one way of looking at it. It goes a lot further than that when it comes to the security and st stability and, and the operability concerns of actually pocking out and, and using these things. But yeah, there's a filter that needs to happen before your organization even gets there, but your organization should be part of that discussion or 
or use something maybe that helps with that. Um, the organisation then also needs to look at what's specific to itself. Um, uh, there's technical things that may be specific, I'm not sure about that, but there's certainly security, legal, regulatory or cost things that then impact technical or security issues. Um, but so compliance and policy and best practice and standards within an organisation, I think. So we're, we're filtering this out, we've got some nice water now and we're going to make a brew with it. I think I need a coffee. Um, it's an addiction. Okay, so the best practice for an individual project come down to things like, you know, peer review and the code quality that you're actually delivering. There should be some best practice around the SaaS products that you're consuming in your software development lifecycle to ensure that those peer reviews are happening, to ensure that what you're delivering on the back of that are using patterns um, and uplift the application and use the right dependencies, uh, dependencies that are approved first by the community, then by the organisation, and then again that pertain <coughs> to this particular problem domain of your actual application. So your operational concerns, you know, obviously um, come into that um, in the SRE landscape. Um, so I'm getting closer now. So it's definitely a software product we're talking about. Um, and a product that can help in this delivery landscape would potentially simplify the experience from the developer point of view and um, simplify the choice um, whilst allowing this coded best practice in open source product. So a perfect pairs. It's kind of a, a thought experiment here. Does it exist? It's a platform deliver for delivery. So a pairs, whether it be internal to your organization run by a platform team or whether it's a product in and of itself, it should be automation that scales beyond an organization in the most ideal sense, I would ascertain. Um, so from an operational perspective, that's delicious. Um, <laughs> from an organizational perspective, um, it's already delicious. Um, the application should deliver, be delivered simply, but attain to all those issues around compliance and regulation and audit and visibility for the organization and security. Um, and from a development perspective, simple best choice, um, drive observability concerns for the developer and for the project so they can see when things are failing and how often they're failing and, and all of those four basic metrics of observability for dev. Um, but the best practice, I, I, I touched on it, but you know, a product which condenses all of this is what I'm trying to get at, maybe provide some of these facilities to developers. So a new pairs, I mean this is again um, hypothetical at this point, maybe won't be eventually, and it's certainly an Apria aspiration um, in this space, but to be developer focused is what we want, um, and we want to deal with all operational concerns, because a PaaS shouldn't just leave the organisation or the application team hanging after giving them a pattern for some delivery, it should potentially take in the whole life cycle from source control all the way through to operations and the monitoring um, and the um, platform itself. So, um, yeah, balancing being prescriptive and flexible, I would say, are the biggest challenges. But I think if all those filters have worked well and there's enough engagement from enough people, maybe that's a thing. Um, so, some questions. If I may get a show of hands, it's being videoed, but maybe not for everyone. But Hey, let's see. So, how many people in this room are using a PaaS? Cool. And how many people in this room, actually, fancy animation time, how many people are using um, a PaaS that's internal? Just a slight mix on that. And externally? Okay. Um, and how many people are entirely happy with their PaaS? Good. Um, <laughs> Okay, so how many people can't use a PaaS? I mean, it could have been one of those two reasons, but for whatever reason, first. Good, that's a correct answer. Um, and who thinks there's political constraints? I mean, no one thought. Okay, maybe. I mean, I would 
imagine from working across industry that hopefully those are addressable. I mean, there are constraints, obviously, but um, hopefully addressable. And technical constraints, I would very well imagine working <laughs> in the industry that those are addressable too. Um, so how many people would be interested in new PASs? Nearly the right answer, nearly the right answer. So thank you very much for your time. I, I guess the takeaways from this slider here, so I would say product scale over configuration. Of course, configuration is needed, maybe defined by really good products, but you know, hopefully that's shrinking. Um, best practices hopefully reside in code because they're repeatable and testable and scalable. Um, and a pair should be simple, flexible, complete, and cloud native. Thank you very much. Um, those are my contact details. Cheers. Okay, any so we've got a question for <laughs> Lewis. Any questions at all, please? Hello, <laughs> Mr. Sun. I've got to say this, Lewis. I remember 1996 as well, when you reported the encryption. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone in this room has got it, you have the e commerce journey to where we are today. Here's a question. Okay. Going back to your 96 main, main mindset, mm -hmm. talking the first instigation <laughs> of TLS, mm -hmm. Netscape created e commerce. Did everyone here know that? Please say yes. Yeah. Yeah. This man is a piece of history. <laughs> we are now in the fourth crypto war. It's going to affect your deliveries. Yesterday, anyone taking anything off the web in HTTPS under American law, under their CFA, Regardless of any policies, Ninth Circuit binned it. That has changed the paradigm of content globally. Where do you think we're going to be in the years' time? <laughs> That's kind of a, a broad industry question. Um, about Brexit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's another angle on it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can only really frame it in, in, the, in, the, in the perspective of my talk, I guess, because that's what I've been rehearsing. Um, but I guess trying to um, have those filters operate in things that um, enable um, that security um, emergency to be dealt with quickly um, means that, you know, engagement from people within the organisation to be part of this story. I think someone was mentioning uh, having... DevOps or SREs actually committing back, um, as well as myself, um, is probably quite important to the larger organisation that needs to be able to do that. But hopefully, if you have a PaaS from a vendor that's sensitive and operating in this exact space, then they should be able to leap on it on your behalf. So, you know, I guess using a product that can address those things across a wide landscape may be part of the solution. So something like <laughs> Let's not deal with the DAC desktop for you. Anybody here with less left field? Anybody in left field, so I can say that. Sorry. Okay, let's wrap it there. So, um, Lewis, um, that was very, very interesting. Um, appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.